So hello and welcome. Um, my name is Ryan Fong, and I'm one of the co-founders and organizers of Undisciplining the Victorian Classroom. Hopefully all of you who are watching and listening have had a chance to view some of our other Zoom casts and already know that we're using them to stage conversation and create spaces where we can think together about our classroom practices and about our processes of learning and unlearning as teachers. As with all our content at UVC, our goal is to grow and learn together as a community of scholars, especially as we take up the challenge of moving beyond the boundaries of our field and training to address issues of race and racism in our field and classrooms. This is the third in a cluster of Zoom casts on moving beyond the strict and traditional confines of the quote unquote literary and how and why this move is so important to undisciplining Victorian studies and building anti-racist and anti-colonial practices in our classroom spaces. Today, I'm thrilled to be joined by Heiju Kim and Nick Kobla. Heiju is an instructor of English at Syracuse University where she recently earned her PhD. She's working on a book project on representations of medical liberty and alternative health practices, and her essays have appeared in Literature and Medicine and, journal, and the Journal of Victorian Culture. Nick is a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan, where he's writing a dissertation on the function of play in 19th century science. He has also presented work from a second project on race and transatlantic discourses on the telegraph at NAVSA and the Northeast Victorian Studies Association. So welcome, Heiju and Nick. I'm so pleased uh, that you're here and, and willing to talk with us today. Thank you, Ryan. Yeah. Um, so maybe to get us started, I, I'd like to just kind of begin, because I'm curious to have you talk about what kinds of textual materials and, and even non-textual materials um, you've worked with and encountered in your research from science, medicine, and technology studies. And, Talk a little bit about what insights they've given you um, into studying race in the 19th century. I don't know who wants to start here. Um, I can go okay. first. Oh. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> so for me, scholarly works that unpack the social construction of medical expertise uh, were very helpful. And um, much of it come from the field of medical history or the cultural history of medicine, like S.E.D. Schwartz's work, or more recently, Michael Brown's work. And these, these scholarly works reveal how the construction of medical expertise in the 19th century was negotiated at the cultural and rhetorical level, as well as um, what people would assume um, drawing on scientific methods, um, which itself um, needs to be unpacked as well. So um, really inspired by those works, I looked into the counter group, medical dissenters, um, and their use of rhetorical strategies and how they deployed certain rhetoric and uh, metaphor to oppose professional medical authority. Mm. And um, I kind of realized that race is a really important factor here because Medical dissenters call for medical li liberty, which is um, the topic of my research, um, which seems to be some sort of democratic aspiration towards um, accessibility of health and sort of this kind of um, um, anti-elitism. Um, actually, that um, desire for medical liberty and the um, pursuit of that desire really relies a lot on the rhetoric of natural self, which conflates health and able-bodied whiteness. Mm -hmm. So medical dissenters drew a lot from the a very romanticized notion of nature, which overlapped hugely with the idea of racial purity, as you can imagine. Mm -hmm. And um, medical liberty was understood um, as part of this larger constellation of English liberties. Right, so um, always uh, medical dissenters um, saw themselves as um, um, these British agents, English subjects who are different from people in the colonies who are used to despotism, who are used to tyranny. And the fact that oppression was here in England um, was the thing they were the most indignant about. Um, mm -hmm. So really thinking about that um, universal rights to um, health and having that medical agency was really dependent upon the subject being white um, subject who is basically claiming middle-class body. Um, mm -hmm. So, mm -hmm. yeah. Mm -hmm. Great, excellent. Nick. Yeah, uh, so when I started studying the history of the telegraph, 
I became really fascinated with the anecdotes that appeared in scholarship on that history. Uh, scholars like Richard Minke have kind of written about the Telegraph, but also used anecdotes as interventions to contextualize Victorian thoughts about that technology. And we all know that's a move that literary scholars do a lot, taking an anecdote and using it as a way of talking about the history of some topic. But we rarely consider those anecdotes in the context in which they were originally presented. So mm. where did those anecdotes come from and how do they circulate? And when I started looking into this question, I realized that a lot of the anecdotes that people use to contextualize what Victorians thought about the telegraph come from 19th century periodicals where they were frequently reprinted and were recirculating in the United States, in Canada, in Britain, in Australia, just around the world. Um, as these anecdotes circulated, they ended up uh, being recontextualized and adapted for different audiences. And as you trace that circulation, you can both see how these anecdotes form different ideas about who is the telegraphic community, who can actually use the telegraph and who is expected to use the telegraph, but also they adapted to meet local concerns. So for example, if an anecdote uh, had a kind of racist implication that the telegraph was only for white users of this technology, as many anecdotes did, then that might be differently in an American context than it did when that same anecdote was reprinted in a British periodical. Mm. And so one of the things that I've really found fascinating is how you can find these anecdotes in 19th century periodicals and in anecdote books and trace their circulation to understand how the ideas about who the telegraph was for was really were really constructed by these anecdotes. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. That's really interesting. And I, I'm struck kind of in, as, as you're both talking, I kind of follow up to this question is, is really kind of the way that you're um, engaging with the archive, right? And so this, this, this series is, is, is about kind of beyond the literary, right? And one, and one of the other folks that we talk, our group of folks that we talked to was um, the Anglophone Chile uh, project, which is also really based in periodicals. Um, so, I mean, I think one of the things I, I'm curious about is, is kind of just your engagements with the, and, and kind of the, the usefulness of turning to periodicals, right? Um, as a really important source that often doesn't fall in, in the, the categories of, of the quote unquote literary, right? It's, it's not a poem, it's not, it's not a novel, right? Um, but it it's, it's generates particular kinds of information and knowledge. Um, and so I'm wondering if you could kind of just talk about like your experience wading into the world of periodicals, um, both, because I get the sense that it's both scientific periodicals of the day and also um, kind of popular periodicals of the day. And Often that's a blurry category between those two things. So I'm just wondering if you can talk a little bit about um, kind of, yeah, entering the archive and, and engaging with these different kinds of materials and what you're able to, to see and glean from those. Um, yeah, that's a really good question. And um, um, I think periodicals are fascinating for many different reasons, but one of it is because it is, it is actually one of the main methods for scientific knowledge production, right? Um, so development of um, medical professionals as this um, professional group relied on the circulation of peer reviewed medical journals, such as the Lancet, which was founded in early 19th century. So this is a system that we still have peer reviewed journals as this um, main method of knowledge production. And what fascinated me was there were all these, what we now understand that's popular journals, um, um, but these people saw themselves as this counterpart to these professional mm -hmm. journals um, mm -hmm. and um, um, was drawing on a lot of, for example, anti-vaccination journals, they draw a lot of um, 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 information from statistics. So they are actually, they wouldn't think themselves as anti-scientific. They would think themselves as scientific, mm -hmm. but against that elitist structure of medical science that marginalize um, um, plebeian voices, mm -hmm. for example. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So there is really interesting rivalry that's going um, there, intervening with the um, scientific method, the system of science, and really allows us to understand scientific system as this cultural construct. Mm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. It's really interesting. Yeah, yeah uh, in a lot of my work, I do also study scientific periodicals, and I want to echo that point about how the scientific periodical is often 
kind of not taken into account as one of the main spaces where scientists are constructing scientific knowledge. Uh, I also want to point out that when you're studying the circulation of uh, anecdotes or any kind of text among 19th century periodicals, you very quickly realize, one, that anonymously written works play a much more important role in the 19th century than has previously been accounted for. I think that we tend to focus so much on works where we can clearly uh, point to an author and ascribe some kind of authorial intent mm -hmm. um, that we often ignore the works that don't have a clear author but can be just as interesting when you're tracing their circulation. Mm -hmm. um, and I also think that it's really important to <laughs> uh, talk about the fact that as these uh, accounts circulate in the 19th century, you can really see the connections between communities that you might think of as being completely insular if you are only focusing just on uh, one account from one periodical. So even in the case of scientific periodicals, you might see someone, the same uh, article be republished in various journals, and that changes the context in which you might understand the way mm -hmm. that people would actually interpret the scientific information being presented. Mm -hmm. uh, so I think that there's a lot of really fascinating work to be done on scientific, uh, scientific periodicals and really any kind of uh, periodical work. Yeah, yeah, absolutely. And I mean, I think that, that the um, and of course, scholars of periodicals, you know, are, <laughs> have long documented, right, like just how important um, it is to treat them at, at, and to bring our skills as literary critics to bear on those and to, to take these um, other kind of contextual inf pieces of information, right, and, 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 and incorporate that um, into the understanding and book historians, right, um, are, do very analogous work in that. So, I mean, I think, yeah, but I think the, the way that you're, um, you're really both highlighting, right? Like the the ways in which even the, our our kind of gold standard today of of knowledge of the peer reviewed um, sort, right? Like when we put that in a historical context, right? It's very easy for us to be like, oh, well, they were getting all this science wrong, right? Or this they didn't understand these technologies and they were doing these nefarious things with it, right? But but it sheds so much light on what how we still construct knowledge um, and. The models of expertise and 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 kind of amateur um, or or layperson kind of approaches, right? And the and the, the tensions um, kind of between those, which I think would be really interesting for our students to kind of think about, um, especially our, our non majors, right? Um, uh, non English yeah. majors, the ones who are coming from the sciences, who who often I don't know always think of themselves as producing um, kind of cultural knowledge, right? In in this in the ways that we we kind of understand as as literary critics. So. Um, which brings me to, to my next question, which is which is about students, right? And thinking about this in the classroom. So um, I, I'm just kind of curious um, what experiences you've had bringing some of these materials into the classroom um, or how you might imagine bringing them into the classroom um, and how you would help students kind of start to unpack um, what what these materials are are doing, um, especially from these 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 periodical sources um, and in these these uh, this information and in, in, in scientific and technology um, materials from from the nineteenth century. How how might you give students a, a bit of a foothold into thinking about those? So I am actually teaching health and medicine in nineteenth century Britain, mm. um, an upper division course this semester, and. Um, I, well, I'll start from a very um, concrete example of what I'm doing in that class, um, um, in a class session. That's actually happening today. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um, I am um, making students read um, an introduction to Sir Patrick Manson's Tropical Diseases, a Manual of the Diseases of Warm Climates. It was first published in 1898. And it is basically a textbook, a textbook for, for tropical medicine. And uh, the introduction is relatively you know short very short and um, um, kind of um, easy to um, grasp on and I'm pairing that with um, a slightly or older text from um, medical history uh, Mark Harrison's The Tender Frame of Man Disease Climate and Racial Difference in India and the West Indies mm. 1760 to 1860 um, it was published in 1996 and um, does a really good job of how the cultural and political need for colonial governance shapes scientific knowledge production in terms of racial imagining racial difference. And um, um, 
they are talking about um, similar things, but not but not quite the same thing. Um, mm. So I think um, the ways in which they reflect on each other um, really helps students to grasp what's going on here. And the introduction to tropical diseases is um, really interesting because it is an introduction to a textbook, but it lacks the kind of um, confidence of um, how to define tropical diseases. And mm. it sort of um, kind of rambles on about what tropical diseases can be. Is it about the climate? Is it about the temperature? Or is it about the flora and fauna from um, um, that um, climate? And at the end of the introduction, um, there is this paragraph um, where the author is, well, I'm just also going to talk about leprosy and bubonic plague, uh, which are not diseases that are dependent on temperature um, in its infection, but still kind of prevalent in tropical and subtropical climate um, because they have backward sanitary um, system. So sort of like really revealing that um, the, the discipline of tropical medicine that he's talking about here is not drawing from what could be understood as this solid and clear scientific principles, but rather from the kind of um, social and political need um, for colonial governance um, to regulate um, disease circulation that's enhanced by global mobility. Um, and um, really close reading such what we now understand as scientific and medical texts helps students realize that, well, actually, it's very, super, very similar to literary texts that we have been reading mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Um, and sort of um, closing the gap between mm -hmm. um, those two, um, two categories of writing um, um, in the classroom, demonstrating that and helping students to do that, I think is one of the most effective ways to um, introduce these texts to mm. classroom. Mm -hmm. Great, great. Nick, I don't know about you. Uh, yeah, so I haven't had the chance to actually bring these materials into my classroom, but I have had the chance to talk with my students about the research that I do, sure. and they always seem very interested and engaged when I'm telling them about, you know, how the circulation of these short accounts about a technology can help to frame expectations about who belongs to that community. Mm. And I think the reason for that is that students are already very aware of the fact that, you know, these kinds of stories circulate. They circulate much more quickly now, um, but I think they already have an intuitive sense of how circulating stories can bring communities together and help people frame who is or is not inside a certain community. Mm -hmm. uh, I think my students also have a much clearer, have a clear sense of the ways in which the stories that we tell about technology can influence who thinks of themselves as being mm. included or excluded. Mm. Um, so for example, uh, some people might recall that in 2009, there was a viral video in which an HP computer couldn't uh, see a, uh, couldn't use its spatial recognition on uh, a black man, but his white coworker could be seen by the computer. And there was a similar issue with iPhone Xs a few years ago. And when those things become viral and they start to circulate, you see very similar mechanisms um, to what you saw in anecdotes about the telegraph. Mm. You see different people focusing on different parts of the story um, and different details being highlighted or being underplayed. And I think students, have a good sense of that fact that these things are still happening today. Mm. Um, I would love to be able to teach a class in which I ask students to focus on some anecdote from some 19th century periodical and trace its circulation, actually map it along with the rest of the class. Because I feel like when you see the places where these anecdotes are reprinted, mm -hmm. you get a much clearer sense of the interconnectedness of um, readers in the 19th century, you undo that kind of insular feeling and realize, oh, people were reading things that were printed originally in London, in the United States, in Australia. Things aren't just British. And I think that's an important thing for students to feel, uh, to be aware of. And then I also think that by choosing an anecdote themselves and tracing its circulation, students can get a much clearer sense of the fact that you aren't just uh, the only options for research are not the canonical texts that we might think of mm -hmm. as 
proper subjects for literary study, that mm -hmm. there are really interesting things you can discover about texts that might seem uh, far more trivial because they are anonymous, but mm -hmm. you could still come up with really interesting arguments by tracing the circulation of these things, seeing where the gaps are, where was this not published? How did it get to the places where it was published? Lots of really interesting questions emerged from that. And I'd love to have the opportunity to encourage students to do that kind of uh, mapping work, that kind of archival research themselves. Yeah, that's awesome. Yeah, and, and I I love yeah that, that sense of kind of using our own research practices and kind of the, the techniques that we've developed, right? Um, which I hear in, in kind of both of your um, both your your responses to that question of, of like how do you how you can become a model, right, for mm -hmm. how to engage this, and then and then our own enthusiasm becomes infectious for them, right? And and all the things that we that we learn, right? I think are, are um, uh, can can become a kind of um, pathway, right, for their for their own learning and, and their discovery too. That that sounds really really exciting. Um, Nikki, I think you kind of, you kind of oh, sorry, Kichi, were you going to follow up? No, I just wanted to add to um, the kind of um, geographical connections that Nikki is mm. pointing out. I think it's um, also interesting to maybe um, sort of um, show that temporal um, connections as well, because one of the activities that I'm planning to do in the second section of my class, which is about medical professionalization and its discontents, um, I um, am going to give them, because um, the Lancet has all its archive on its online homepage, which is, you know, Lancet is still a very, um, you know, it's a top journal in the field of medicine, right? Um, and then they have, like, that you can search um, on their homepage, um, their initial um, issues, um, their issues from early 19th century. And um, I am going to ask my students to explore um, that early archive from the Lancet. And it's, it's going to be in a way, pretty shocking, which was shocking to me, actually, when I was going into the research, because it's really, there's a lot of opinion pieces of mm. how <laughs> um, doctors should be, you know, perceived, um, how doctors should behave. Uh, there were a lot of these political opinions, um, largely from the founder of The Lancet. So um, sort of like seeing that um, in relation to um, what looks much more professional, what looks like much uh, the uh, present day Lancet, um, mm. it's pages which look uh, much more professional to our, uh, our own eyes, uh, will be an interesting practice um, to understand the historicity mm. of the development of that scientific uh, discipline, the discipline of biomedicine. Yeah. Mm. That's fascinating. Yeah. Yeah. And I think, you know, I think all of these responses, I think, are also pointing to um, I'm sure all of our, our watch viewers and listeners are, are, are feeling the kind of resonance and timeliness, right, of, of your projects um, to today. Um, and the, you know, with the COVID pandemic, uh, with the ways in which information and disinformation um, is, is traveling and what gets marked as information and disinformation by whom and in what communities. I mean, I think your, your research um, and the way that, that you're, you're approaching these topics speaks so much to that. So I'm, I'm wondering if you could just say more about that, like what kinds of stakes have gotten raised for you for thinking about these materials in our present moment. Um, and, you know, as two scholars of, of Victorian studies, right? Um, in Victorian technology, Victorian science, Victorian medicine, right? Like, like, kind of just what's what's hitting you, right? And and how that's infusing the kinds of conversations that you you're having or want to have with your students um, about the relevance of these issues and materials. I mean, anti-vaccination movement. It's just <laughs> <laughs> what can I say? And. Um, um, and um, yeah, that's, you know, uh, some questions and issues around um, the anti-vaccination movement um, has been coming up in my class, even though we have not uh, yet um, been reading the pamphlets um, themselves together, uh, which is going to be um, coming in the second half of the class. Um, but I, I want to talk a little bit about um, kind of a um, general um, framework that I am um, trying to bring in um, when I'm teaching 19th century medicine. Um, um, so what I'm trying to do is uh, when I'm putting together uh, the syllabus together and sort of um, introducing my class to my students, um, 
I am really focusing on the present moment rather than 19th century. So instead of um, giving them a lecture about 19th century medicine and ask them to think about the implications, today I am sort of turning that around and talking about 21st century moment that we are living in together first. And then in order to actually understand that anti expertise sentiments today, anti vaccination movement today, we really have to look into 19th century because that's mm. when, you know, the anti-vaccination movement, for example, first arose. And um, if we don't understand um, the very um, specific ways in which medical expertise was negotiated in 19th century and how um, people, many people were actually against that idea of forming a professional community, we really cannot understand what's going on today. So mm -hmm. my approach um, well, with my students has been, um, let's look at 19th century because if we don't do that, we cannot really understand what's going on today. Mm -hmm. And um, students have been responding pretty well so far now, <laughs> yeah, mm -hmm. to that approach. Mm -hmm. yeah. yeah. Yeah, I think that from my perspective, what I have been, uh, <laughs> learning about the stakes of my project over the last couple of years is the importance of uh, my project as an example of how texts continue to circulate today, continue to be adapted in ways that uh, people might not be aware of. The 19th century has a similar circulation of texts, but it is a somewhat easier model to look at partially because of the incompleteness of databases where you only have so many <laughs> examples of uh, an anecdote that was reprinted. Um, but you can look at that and you can understand how different details are preserved and how when something is reprinted or recirculated, it might not have all of the context of the original version. So for example, in, the, in 1900, there was a newspaper account it was the first positive account I have found of two, uh, of two Black people being married by telegraph. One was a Ninth Cavalry um, trooper in New Mexico. He married mm -hmm. his wife, Lizzie Hummins, by telegraph, uh, mm -hmm. and she was in Kentucky. And when that anecdote circulated, the fact that they were Black did not always appear. And sometimes that information was conveyed just by the fact that he was a member of the Ninth Cavalry, which has historically been a Black unit. And so when that anecdote appears in Australia, it doesn't mention that the two people getting married are people of color, just says that he was a member of the Ninth Cavalry. That context is completely taken away, but it wasn't a purposeful um, censorship, I don't believe. I believe that it was simply the fact that context changes as that anecdote circulated to a new audience. And we do see similar things happen today. Sometimes the changes are purposeful. Sometimes it's just the nature of circulating text. But I do mm -hmm. feel like understanding those kinds of mechanisms is an important part of digital literacy. And so anytime I can help my students to improve their digital literacy and realize, okay, when let's say a politician retweets something that's been retweeted 20 times mm -hmm. in a very short period of time, it might not have all the details <laughs> that were originally present in that work. And it's important to know how to trace the circulation of something if you think that it's meaningful and find the original version with that context. That's great, yeah. Yeah, and it's it's making me think too, I mean, like, like the, the these strategies of, of putting our, our moment and, you know, the, the materials that you're looking at in conversation with one another, whether you start, I mean, I think, hey, Jude, the way you're talking about, I mean, it's like a classic pedagogical principle, right, of, of starting where your students are, right, and it's just kind of, what do they know, what do they assume, what are, where are they at, and, and I think, Nick, you're doing this too, of then, like, historicizing that, bringing that back and saying, how does, how is it so important that we, we understand and know what's going on um, in the 19th century context can, can help us understand why things are the way they are, um, today. Um, yeah, it also, I mean, I think is, is a really great strategy for grappling off, I think, often with the really overt racism of these texts, right, the, the really uncomfortable nature um, of the materials themselves, um, mm -hmm. and um, figuring out how to deal with them honestly, seriously, rigorously, right, but not apologetically, um, and, and, and to kind of think about um, 
this this kind of presentist move, I think, uh, as a kind of anti-racist strategy um, for like the, like we're not we're not separate from from that racism there, right? It's like this is directly connected to racist memes that circulate, right? Um, uh, it's connected to the 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 overbearing and, and overriding whiteness of the anti vax of strains of the anti-vaccination movement today, right? It's like how how we can kind of make those connections seems really really powerful. Yeah, I've also been thinking recently, uh, to continue that thought, about the ways in which we as scholars are part of that continued circulation of these texts. Mm. We are providing context. We are hoping that the context we provide is worth dealing with these unpleasant topics because we can learn something by continuing to talk about them. But in the age of... Um, you know, Zoom meetings and remote conferences, I've become more aware of the fact that if I share a slide deck with somebody, it is out there and able to be recirculated mm. fairly easily in a way that maybe things weren't um, when people um, were doing in-person conferences and giving handouts. The fact that we're part of the circulation of these things has always been true, but I do think that it's something to keep in, <laughs> that we should be uh, actively thinking about and it shouldn't be something that we just assume is not going to be a problem. We need to be thinking about the fact that anytime we talk about these things, we do risk that context being removed in the same way that anything that, uh, can lose its context. Yeah, yeah, that's a really powerful insight. And um, and I think, you know, um, we're unfortunately running out of time here, but I think that's, a, that's just a, a great way to end, right? To think about our teaching as its own technology of circulation, right? And to think about how we're in, embedded in the processes of, of, of circulation and, and recirculation and contextualization. So, um, so what kind of work do we need to do and be, and be mindful of, I think is, is, is just a really great place to, to end our conversation. So um, thank you so much both. I, I really enjoyed this and, and appreciate it so much. Thank you so much, Ryan. Thank you so much for having this us here and letting us talk about these. Yeah, take care. All right. Bye-bye.